Hello everyone and thank you for coming. As Professor Stanislav said, my name is Lauren Cadlitz and I spent the summer in Los Alamos, New Mexico, working on high voltage component testing for the NEDM project at Oak Ridge National Lab. Thank you to Professor Stanislaus and my mentors in Los Alamos for giving me this opportunity. Let's start with some background information. What is an NEDM? NEDM stands for Neutron Electric Dipole Moment. A dipole moment is calculated by taking the distance between two charges and multiplying it by the magnitude of the charges. Each neutron has three quarks inside it, an up quark with a positive two-thirds charge and two down quarks with negative one-third charge each. So the sum of the charges in the neutron is zero and the neutron is neutral. However, we don't know how these three charges are spaced. So since we know the magnitude of the charges, but not the distribution, we don't know the NEDMs. The standard model, a very highly respected physics model, predicts that the NEDM would be around 10 to the minus 31st electron centimeters, which is minuscule. The goal of the experiment I worked on was to test that figure. So how do we do that? To start, when we have a neutron, we can apply a magnetic field, and that will cause it to spin, because a neutron has a magnetic dipole moment. We can also apply an electric field, and if there is an electric dipole moment, that'll cause it to spin as well. So we start by applying a pulse, which rotates at 90 degrees, and applying both a magnetic and an electric dipole moment, sorry, both a magnetic and an electric field that causes it to spin laterally, like so. It's a very small magnetic field with a very large electric field. And we measure this frequency. Then we flip the direction of the electric field, which subtracts from the total charge, and we measure the frequency again. If we see any difference between the original frequency and the new frequency, we know an NEDM exists, and we can calculate it using this equation right here. This experiment has been done many times before, and as of now, we know that if an NEDM exists, it's less than 3.6 times 10 to the minus 26 electron centimeters. Remember, we always use a very large electric field and a very small magnetic field for the best result and for the most precise answer. So 19 years ago, a new experiment was proposed, which could get an even larger electric field by using cryogens. That's liquid helium and liquid nitrogen. This experiment is a collaboration between about 20 labs with the final apparatus being built at Oak Ridge National Lab. Los Alamos National Lab, where I worked at, was tasked with creating this very large electric field of about 75,000 volts per centimeter and a very cool temperature, 0.4 degrees Kelvin. So the final apparatus is built in Oak Ridge National Labs, but I was working in Los Alamos National Lab. So in order to do any testing, we had to use models. However, liquid helium is very expensive. So we wanted to use the least amount of liquid helium possible to get the most testing done. For that reason, we used three different models. Introducing the half-scale high voltage system, which is half the volume of the final apparatus and is cryogenic. It was used for the cryogenic testing and to test larger components. We also have the room temperature high voltage system, and as its name implies, it was run at room temperature, so it used no cryogens whatsoever. This was used for more preliminary testing before we added the complications of cryogens. And finally, we had the small scale high voltage system, which was used for smaller component testing and was also cryogenic. So in order to create this electric field, we had, it, had to transport electricity from outside the system into a bath of liquid helium. So to do that, we used a high voltage chain, which is what I worked on. The chain moved the electricity from the high voltage feed through through three cryogenic feed throughs and all the way into the terminating ball, which was in the central volume. The, the apparatus at Oak Ridge National Labs has the central volume where the neutrons will be stored. So this is where we want to create the high electric field. And the high voltage in the central volume in that terminating ball is what creates the electric field. The goal for this chain was to get up to 200,000 volts. And I worked on both installing the chain and installing various parts of the half-scale system. Recall that the 
half scale system is cryogenic. So it used four layers to keep it cool. The outermost layer was in vacuum. A layer in from that was liquid nitrogen. And then the central volume, which houses that terminating ball, was in liquid helium. Also off to the side, we had a helium-3 vat. Helium-3 is similar to normal liquid helium, which is helium-4, except it has only one neutron rather than the standard two. And the important property about that is it can get to cooler temperatures than normal liquid hel helium can. Here's the central volume and where the liquid helium is stored. So off to the left here, you can see a schematic of this cooling system. In the three separate places, we say the word pump. That just means that we add a um, vacuum pump to the bath, which forces the, the liquid to evaporate, and that evaporated liquid takes some heat with it. So it cools the system. This is called evaporative cooling. Also, right here, you can see that the helium-3 bath is physically connected to the central volume through a process called conductive cooling. So the helium-3 is cooling the helium-4 in the central volume. So before we could do any of that testing, we wanted to make sure that the chain was able to function without cryogens. And we used the room temperature system to do this testing. The configuration was very similar to the one in the half scale system with a high voltage feed through at the top, terminating at uh, the terminating diode, and with one cryogenic feed through in the center. This was configured with four ball joints, three hollow rods, and a resistor. The goal, just like the half scale system, was to get up to 200,000 volts, and we used a 200,000 volt um, power supply to do so. We did a total of nine tests with this, with different configurations, and tried to optimize the smoothness, absorption, and the physical positioning of the chain. In the original design, we had a resistor right here. However, we couldn't get up to 200,000 volts with this resistor, so we tried it without, using a coupling that just attached the two balls together right here. This was successful, which indicated that the resistor was the original problem. However, we couldn't just stay with the coupling because the physical positioning wouldn't um, be able to fit into the half scale, so we ended up using the solid rod, um, but that couldn't get up to the 200,000 volts. So we finally ended up with a rod with a larger diameter that was hollow, shown here. These are just a few of the tests that we ended up running. I helped construct each um, each different chain and run the tests themselves. One thing that you may notice in all of these chains is that they're shiny, and that's not for aesthetic reasons. When you have a point or a ridge on one of these high voltage chains, that creates a higher electric field region around the point and can cause it to spark. If you have too much sparking, that's called breakdown, and it can damage both the high voltage chain and the electrical equipment surrounding them so we try to avoid it at all costs. However, if it sparks for just a second, it can burn off the ridge, making the surface smoother and improving the system overall. For this reason, we use a method called conditioning to do the testing. In blue, we have voltage. Notice how we go up five or 10 kilovolts and then wait for a while. Go up again and wait in this kind of stair-step pattern. Then, around 110 or 120 kilovolts, you start to see these vertical orange lines that indicate sparking. So right away, we're seeing a lot of sparking um, so because the surface is pretty rough. But as it sparks, it's burning off the surface and improving the system. So over here, you see less sparking as we stay at the same voltage. We increase the voltage again, which causes more sparking, and wait until the sparking goes away to then continue the process again and again. This is called conditioning, and we could get to far larger voltages doing this. Part of my contribution was not only running these tests, but I also wrote the code that um, ran the test that controlled the voltage and displayed the voltage current and pressure, so we knew exactly where we were in the conditioning process. As of now, I've been talking about trying to prevent breakdown in the half scale in the room temperature system. However, on the small scale system, we were actually simulating the breakdowns. 
we were testing diodes and we were trying to increase the voltage until we saw a breakdown and record the data. The small scale system is a 50,000 volt system and so that was the maximum we could take our voltages to. One problem with the system, however, is that it goes through so many breakdowns, it's really easy for the equipment to be damaged. So I helped make the equipment more robust, and I also wrote code that would increase the voltage until we saw a breakdown, then immediately shut everything off to try to minimize any damage, and repeat the process automatically to automatically ob obtain data. Here on the outside of this um, small scale system, we can see the liquid nitrogen bath, and way on the inside is the liquid helium bath and the diodes we were testing. Here's an example of some of the data that was obtained um, with different diodes. Notice that we are counting the amount of times it breaks down and recording the electric field during that point. It gives us this nice distribution, so in the future when we do testing, we can, um, we can know how likely it is to break down at different points. Finally, Professor Stanislaus asked me to talk a little bit about Los Alamos more generally. Los Alamos was a fantastic place to work. It was built in the 1940s for the Manhattan Project because of its very remote location on a mesa, which means that you get these beautiful views of the Rio Grande. Um, the geography is very mountainous, and nearby is one of the national monuments, the Bandelier. And just a few miles walk away from the lab, we found this really cool rock. <laughs> um, I was really scared at first to go to Los Alamos because it was my first time living alone. Um, and I was especially scared because about a, they only had about a quarter of the interns that they normally did this year. However, when I, I did eventually find friends, as shown here, that was me, and we had a fantastic time. Although they spent most of their time at the bar, which I did not go to, they, we also went hiking and did, did board games and had parties, and of course, went to the iconic Los Alamos concert, shown here. Every Friday, there was a free concert at the park, which was absolutely fantastic. The entire town would go, which really shows how close-knit this community is. Since 40% of the people in Los Alamos work at Los Alamos National Lab, everybody you talk to is a scientist. Mm -hmm. And everyone has an amazing story to tell. About 95% of the lab is government classified, which at first was really scary because I'm not used to so much security. But I eventually took it in stride um, and found it really cool to have such cool privileges at a private location. Up in the center, you can see Andy and Bill, my host family, who treated me like their own daughter. They were absolutely fantastic. And of course, I couldn't do this speech without including their fluffy children, mm. Hazel, Ozzy, Zeke, and Zoe. Um, and over there to the right is Professor Stanislaus and I, the very first day I went to Los Alamos. If any of you have the opportunity to study physics at Los Alamos, I would highly recommend it. I learned a lot about physics and engineering, but I learned even more about the process of the process of science, how research is done, and how to be an adult in a research location. Thank you again to Professor Stanislaus, Valparaiso University, Los Alamos National Lab, the National Science Foundation, and the Department of Energy for giving me this opportunity.